I went to the doctor once with my son labeled. His name is Chaim. And they're like, Chaim? Chaim. I'm sitting there like, Chaim, Chaim. I don't know who's Chaim. I just want to know why it's spelled C-H. How do you want to do Ch? There's no Ch. Only in Spanish there's a J. Spanish, I know. Chaim. <coughs> okay. Ready to go? Tonight is our concluding episode of the four-part series on Elul. And some of what we talked about earlier will play into the things we're going to learn tonight. Although tonight is a stand-alone subject, it's not an exhaustive subject. And allow me to explain. If I were to give you a lecture, a history lecture, by Julius Caesar, there's nobody who could give in one hour, a lecture about everything about Julius Caesar. You could talk about Julius Caesar's, uh, Caesar's youth, or maybe you could talk about his ascension to the throne, or maybe you could talk about a particular epoch or event within Julius Caesar's life. If you want to talk about Abraham Lincoln, you would talk about Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War, or Abraham Lincoln and his political methodology. How did he manage to get elected in his time? Could he be elected today, and so on and so forth. The Satan, Satan, is a very broad subject. It's impossible for me, really for anybody, to exhaustively deal with the subject and fully explain something which in some ways is inexplicable. In some ways inexplicable because we're talking about a spiritual reality that we do not have a frame of reference for. Just as a blind person will never appreciate the difference between the color and different hues just as a person born deaf can never appreciate, appreciate the beauty of music, as Rambam says, will never really fully understand spiritual concepts. However, there is much to say about Satan. And yes, he's Jewish. <laughs> or at least he's part of our Jewish tradition. Tonight's class will focus on a chapter in Satan's existence, and that is the Satan and the month of Elul, which leads us into Rosh Hashanah. Because as we learned in our previous classes, Elul and Rosh Hashanah are not mutually exclusive. Now, you will become acquainted with Satan tonight to some degree because you'll learn about an important part of the Satan's existence. And then we'll focus primarily on how that fits into the month of Elul and, and, and Rosh Hashanah and why it's important, why we, why we even need to know about this and why, why we need to talk about it and how it actually makes a difference in our Jewish observance. But that's enough prefacing. Let's get into the subject. So we'll start here. Ami doesn't believe there's a Satan. Ami says, there's no Satan. That's ridiculous. We Jews don't believe in Satan. Hashem and doesn't have competition. Hashem doesn't have competition. Ah, but I never said Hashem has competition. I said, there's something called Satan. And you remind me of a conversation I had many years ago with somebody who said to me, Rabbi, we don't believe in the resurrection, do we? And I looked at him and I said, nah. We just mentioned that in Ashmon Esrei three times a day. Mechaya <laughs> Mesim is the second blessing of the Amida. But that, no. I mean, it just happens to be the crowning principle of our, of our 13 principles of faith. And that is the destiny and end all of uh, Jewish history as we know it. But no, we don't believe in the resurrection. Now, why did he say we don't believe in it? Because when he said the resurrection with a capital T-H, he did not refer to the Jewish idea of Tchiyas HaMesim. He knew nothing about that. He knew about the resurrection as it describes a particular narrative within a faith system that is foreign to Judaism. So within a faith system foreign to Judaism, the resurrection represents something we certainly do not believe in. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Or conversations, I had this on the radio actually. So she says to me, Rabbi, we don't, we, what, I want to talk about reincarnation. I go, reincarnation? She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she begins to describe the Zen Buddhist idea of reincarnation. I'm like, we don't believe in that. We don't believe in reincarnation? I said, absolutely not. How could that be? I heard uh, the Kabbalah talks about it. I said, oh, the Kabbalah talks about Gilgul Neshamas. When you say reincarnation, you didn't mean Gilgul Neshamas because you don't know anything about Gilgul Neshamas. All you know about is the Zen Buddhist idea of reincarnation. So you're saying we believe in reincarnation. I was here. I am here. I will be here. No, it's not exactly like that. In fact, it's not like that at all. So... When people use the term Satan, what people in the West have come to think of is a force or power with which God has to contend. And sometimes God even loses. But in the end, he'll win. In the end, he'll win. I once did a television show with a bunch of different faith leaders. I asked Rabbi Shachat, should I do this? Like, I didn't want us to deal with polemics. 
And he said to me that if you will not represent the Jewish people, they'll get somebody, somebody who will represent the Jewish people who will speak kfirah, will speak ideas which are totally antithetical to Torah, and that won't be good. So don't engage in any polemical arguments, or any, 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 just state your position. Fine, so I had my marching orders. And, and um, it was very interesting. <laughs> we covered a lot, of, a lot of interesting ground. What was, I started to say this for a reason. I wanted to tell you something. Oh, so the, the question was about honesty. It was a whole thing about honesty. And the, the interviewer who adopted a foreign faith but actually was born Jewish, and quite a clever fellow. So he says, he says to this person, so you, you say you never lie. He says, no, no, the leader of our faith says you never let a lie, never lie. He says, tell me, as a, as a faith leader, do you visit the hospital sometimes? And he said, he said yes. He said, do you... What do you tell people who are very sick, who are the doctors that are dying? He says, no, I, I, I try to give them hope. I give them optimism. I tell them that, you know, you could recover. He says, but that, that would be a lie. That would be a lie. So he says, well, no, no, it's not a lie because right now they're in Satan's hands. But who knows? Maybe God will win this round. <laughs> <laughs> and they just asked me, what do you say? And I said, God is always in control. Anything could happen. There was a man named Chizkiyo who was on a deathbed whose days were finished. And guess what? He went out to live for another 15 years. We'll talk about him a little later on today. Hashem changed his dinu mishpat. So we trust in Hashem. And therefore, Hashem tells us that even if you have a sharp sword resting on your throat, al yimna min harachmim. We never give up hope. Never give up hope. And there's an amazing story that's recently been told about somebody who had an ISIS uh, sword, literally, a knife on their throat. And before their throat was slashed, the knife bearer, knife wielder, was taken out by an SAS sniper. Wow. British sniper. And it's like, literally, like I, when I saw this story, I said, a filu cherev chada, a sharp sword, munachas al tzavarecha, is on your throat, literally, So, you are right. The Satan who is God's competition, the Satan who God has to chas v'shalom heaven from wrestling with, of course you don't believe in that. Of course not. But to say there's no such thing as satan is patently ridiculous. Why, why is it ridiculous? My mother believed in the Dibbuk. Okay, the Dibbuk's will do a different night. The, the, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> save something for another time. It's impossible to say there's no satan. It's, it's ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? Why? Because, because the Torah talks about it. And I will give you some examples. This is not exhaustive. This is some examples. With the satan, I will share with you where I believe the first time the satan actually shows up by name in the scripture, in the Chumash. And it's with regard to a, an unsavory character who even had a donkey who talked. His name is Bilam. Bilam. Yeah. So Bilam was going on this nefarious mission. He wanted to curse the Jewish people. He was very gleefully excited about this. And in the end, God says, okay, you can go, but remember, you're not going to say whatever you want. You're just going to say the words I put in your mouth. And Bilam is convinced that he will be able to somehow get God to agree with him. And so Bilam sets off. And the Torah says that God's anger flares at Bilam because he really didn't want Bilam to go. And Bilam knew he didn't want him to go. Numbers 22, 22. God is angry. An angel of God stands along the road to satan him. Now, and here it's a verb, but the noun would be satan. The noun is satan. I mean, don't make noises until we're finished, okay? You're going to have to control yourself for the next half hour. And then if you still want to disagree with me, we can argue about it. So Rashi says, L'satan loy, literally to Satanize him. Rashi says, Malach shorachamim hoya. This is not the bad satan. This is not the proverbial guy with the red skin and the pitchfork. No. This is actually a kind angel. It says he's a malach, but doesn't say there are bad malachim and good malachim. The Gemara is very explicit about that. The end of Masechet Shabbat. So he says, this was an angel, a kind angel. Well, if he was a kind angel, then why did he want to sut on him? So Rashi says, He was trying to stop him from sinning. 
And because he was a malach of rachman, because he was a malach of mercy, of compassion, now Bilam was not deserving of compassion. Bilam was a bad man, wanting to do a bad thing, who deserved his own bitter end. But rachamim, mercy or compassion, means that you feel bad even for somebody who doesn't deserve it. So this guy doesn't deserve compassion, but the malach of rachamim, he is compassion. So compassion shows up. And he's trying to save him from himself. Shola so that he would not sin, v'yeved. And then he will be gone forever, which is, of course, what happens. So Rashi says, Malach shol rachamim hoya. How, how do we know this, though? How do we know? So the Be'er Ma'im Chaim says, well, the Pasuk starts off in Yichar Af Elohim. We know God has two different names. Elohim is the name of God which is used for severity or judgment or when God is angry. The name Yud Kevavke, Havaya, is the name of God that represents kindness, benevolence. And here we have a name where it's the Malach of God who's benevolent, Malach Hashem. The same Pasuk starts off saying, Vayichar Af Elohim. The anger of God flares. That makes sense that the word Elohim might be used. But later on in the Pasuk it says, Malach Hashem. Oh, says Be'er Machayim. That's Rashi's proof that this had to be a Malach. Otherwise, it had to be a Malach of mercy. Otherwise, it would say Malach Elohim, a Malach of judgment who came to actually harm Bilam. Well, if he's trying to stop him, but he's not trying to harm him. And it says also, L'satan Loi. He came, L'satan Loi. Loi means for him. Says Be'er Machayim, for his benefit. So what does it... Why did Bilam have a sword? No, the Satan. The, the well, the Satan was trying to stop him. You can't stop him without, so to speak, the proverbial weapon or ability. And this is all a, a nevuah. It's not literally a physical sword. A malach doesn't need a physical sword to kill. It's all euphemistic. It's, 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 it's parable. Now, just to help you understand, the Rashi doesn't really explain the word Satan. He doesn't tell us the etymology of the word. But Rabbeinu Meyuchas, for example, says... That whenever we have the word satan anywhere in the scripture, he calls it satina. Satina would mean satanize. He says it's always an asekra. It's always a bad thing. It's always something which thwarts, corrupts, or pushes a person in a bad direction. It's turning a person into a bad path. Kind of cajoling or pushing him, but not in a good way, in a bad way. Think of it this way. Some people will bring the worst out in you. What should you do with those people? If you ask me, stay away. Don't shoot them. This is not the Wild West. <laughs> stay away. <laughs> if they bring the worst out in you, stay away. What do people bring at the best in you? Engage with them. Be with them. The Mishnah tells us, a shach ra or a shach in taiv. A good neighbor, a bad neighbor. What should you embrace? A good neighbor. What should you stay away from? A bad neighbor. So that's what Abinam Yucha says the word l'satan le means. Now, in the Yalkut Midrash Taman, which is a fascinating collection of really ancient Midrashim of the sages of Yemen, it says over there that this is the same Satan who showed up in the time of Avram Avinu. But I didn't quote it tonight because it's not mentioned in the scripture. It's only mentioned in the oral tradition that a Satan tried to stop Avram when he was going for his tenth and final test, the Akedah, the binding of Yitzchak. Now what was he doing? What was the Satan trying to do? He was trying to thwart Avram's efforts. He was trying to impede Avram from doing. Well, in the same way, this Malach comes to impede Bilam from doing what he's trying to do. And finally, the Medrash HaGadol says, why is he called a Satan? Loma nikra shmoi Satan. So le Satan is not just a verb. Le Satan, from the Medrash HaGadol's perspective, even as it shows up in the book of Numbers, chapter 22, is a noun, a Satan. He says, why is he called a Satan? And he says, she misate, or mishate esa adam, because it thwarts, corrupts, or twists a person, drives him crazy. It forces him or cajoles him or pushes him to go beyond rhyme and reason. Beyond which is good, rational, and appropriate. It makes him do inappropriate things. And this is, in a sense, the notion of the Satan who comes to push Bilam off the way he's going. Now, Bilam thinks he's very, very smart. He thinks he's going at what's good for him. It's very bad for him, but he thinks it's good for him. And this Malach came to Satan him, which is actually good. So it's funny, the first time Satan's mentioned in the Torah, it's a good guy, not a bad guy. But he's not actually called a Satan. He's called a Malach Hashem. He's called a Malach of Rachamim, who assumes a role, he's playing a role of Satan. Why is he playing a role of Satan? Because it happens to be, in this unique case, the, the Satanizing of Bilam was a good thing, not a bad thing. But typically, the Satan is a bad guy. 
So I thought that would be just an interesting place to start. Patience, just a place to start. Now let's talk a little scripture. Let's go, let's go. We're going to talk about a man named Job, Eov. And the reason we're going to talk about a man named Job is because there are different opinions when Eov lived, if he lived at all. There's a Gemara Meseches Bava Basra, and there's a whole discussion about Eov. And I'm going to very briefly paraphrase what the Rambam says in Mor Nevuchim in the third section, in the 22nd chapter, where he talks about the concept of, he talks about Eov actually. And, and when he talks about Eov, he talks about the Satan. And he says that there are essentially four opinions in the Talmud. One is that Eov lived in the time of the patriarchs. Another opinion is he lived in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. Instantly, that's what Rashi and Pshut Mikra seems to indicate. He follows that, those Midrashim. There is an opinion that he lived in the time of David HaMelech. And even though the Gemara itself seems to deflect that opinion, the Rambam nonetheless understood from the Gemara that it is a possibility. And in the end, nobody really knows. And that's why the Rambam finishes off, and you know he says, all of this compellingly leads us into the conclusion, the fourth opinion in the Talmud, that he never happened. That a whole Job is one big metaphor. And it's a concept. But and the Rambam says this. The Rambam in Mordevuchim says, there was definitely a man in Eov at some point living somewhere. And some of these things happened to him. But he says, the story of Eov, the narrative of Eov, the, the, the imagery of Eov, is not about a person. It's a concept. He could have been a person too, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is it represents these challenges of faith and so on and so forth. And tonight's class is not about Eov, and I'm not going to dwell on this. But the bottom line is, Eov could have been as ancient as the patriarchs themselves. Well, here in the very first chapter of Eov, we hear about Rosh Hashanah. This is the second time Rosh Hashanah is mentioned explicitly in the scripture. The first time, of course, when Adam and Eve are created. And now we have, it says, Vayhi Hayom. Chapter 6 of the book of Job, verse, uh, pardon me, verse 6 of chapter 1. The day, Hayom, the day. What's the day? You have 365 days in a year. Which is the day? Right? Which is the day? So Rashi says, Hayom, Osa Yom, Shehoya, Rosh Hashanah. That was Rosh Hashanah. And we know that Rosh Hashanah is a day in which all of humankind is judged. It's not just a day for Jewish people, it's a day for everybody. Famous story with the Rebbe uh, who meets a New York Times reporter named Ari Friedman and, and a, a, a young black like a non-Jewish woman who's a photographer and I don't remember her name and the Rebbe wishes them a happy new year and they drive off and the Rebbe says to Rabbi Krinsky, do you have your cell phone with you? And he says, yes. He says, could you please call Ari Goldman and say, tell him when I said to the young lady, happy new year, I meant it. <laughs> I wasn't just saying it to be nice. It's her. It's a new year for her too. We all get judged. Everybody gets judged. So Eov is not Jewish, but Eov is getting judged, right? And so what happens on Rosh Hashanah? Rashi says, well, on Rosh Hashanah, Tziva HaKadosh Baruch Hu Satan. Rashi says, God commanded the Satan, Lahovi Zchut V'chova, to bring both merits and demerits. Meaning to accuse. You stand in the docket and you get accused. Who's the prosecuting lawyer? The Satan. He is the accuser, the proverbial accuser. And I'll go back to the verse itself. The children of God, which is a euphemism, and Rashi says it means malachim. Almost all the Mepharshim say it means malachim. Al Hashem to stand before God. There you go. It's not a verb. It's a noun. It's the noun. Ha-Satan. Not just Satan. The Satan. Or in English, the Satan. So Satan arrived. Very clear. Betocham. Amongst them. Mitsudas Tzian says, B'nei O'lekim, hey malam de aschus. They are the defending lawyers. They are the ones who brought the merits of the people on this day of judgment. Gam ha-satan, what's he doing there? Ah, he is lilamed choiv. He comes to bring demerit. He comes to throw shade. Lekatreg al habrius, to accuse, to bring accusations against all creatures. So there's an angel, there's a proverbial court case, and God has these actors who are playing roles, these angels who are coming, and one of them is a satan. And the Satan comes as an accuser. And the Satan highlights the negativity. He, he points out the negativity before God on this day of judgment. A prosecuting attorney. Very good. Rashi says clearly, to prosecute or to accuse the creatures. Now Ramban tells us that 
you have to understand this not literally. God doesn't sit on a throne and there aren't angels who come showing up wearing robes or a suit and a tie. Obviously, this is, is often euphemistic. He says, this is what we call this can only be understood through the prism or in the notion, the rubric of prophecy. Obviously, this is all prophetic. It's a, it's a, it's a metaphor. Prophecy is all metaphorical. It's not literal, but, but there's this concept of the Satan. And, and the Satan comes, and the Satan, he's the real dude. It's a real thing. Now, Ibn Ezra, he says, you should know that Ibsaji Gon said that uh, the Satan was just a person who was jealous of Job. There was no Satan. He's just a jealous guy. He just came to point out all of Job's shortcomings. He's just one of those really bad neighbors that you don't want to meet. And Ibn Ezra says, you know, with all due respect to the great Ribsadja, he says, I, 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 if I would bring every location, he says, where the Torah mentions the concept of the Satan being an angel, I wouldn't be able to finish his commentary. And, and, and Ibn Ezra says there are many, many examples of the Satan who is discri- discussed in Scripture and in oral tradition in which he's referred to as an angel. So there's a prosecuting or accusing angel and he shows up on Rosh Hashanah. Metaphorically. What does that mean metaphorically? Not that he has a pitchfork and he lives in a cave somewhere up in, uh, in on Lake Nipissin. Well, well, obviously it's a... When you, when you say Malach Machol, is there a Malach called Machol? Is there a Malach called Gavriel? There's a Malach called Satan. What, do you think that people in another faith system believe that Satan is some ferocious guy who's living under the bridge over here? An ogre? They're also going to tell you it's a spiritual concept. There is an angel called Satan. And I'm going to give, give you one more scriptural location. And you cannot just dismiss this because these are our prophecies. This, is, this prophecy is a Haftorah and, and it's the story of Zechariah. And it's a prophecy in which Zechariah sees the, 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 the Kohen Gadol, his name is Yahushua, and he's standing, He's standing before an angel. And in the image, who is standing there on his right? The Satan standing there on his right. It doesn't say the metaphor of the Satan. The Satan is standing there. Is Yuminoi also a metaphor? And what is he there for? The verb, Lesitnoi. He's there to accuse him. Straight up. What does it mean, Satan? Mitzudas David says, Malach Mekatrig, an angel who accuses, an angel who prosecutes. That's what we're talking about. Lusitnoi, what's the verb? Inyan Kitrug. That's the prosecution. That's the accusation. He's accusing, he's prosecuting. Obviously, we're talking about an angel here. By Yemen Hashem Allah Satan, God says to the Satan, Yigir Hashem Bacha, Ha Satan, the Yigir Hashem Bacha. God will, so to speak, rebuke you. The Tzudah Sian says, Yiger is tzaika, to scream at him, nezifa, to give him a, a so to speak, a, 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 a one-up. Huh? Give him a zetz, push him aside. Twice he's told. And as Rashi says, Shalei tikonish lefan of lekatek al-atzadik hazeh. Let him not come forward. Let him not open his mouth. Let him not begin to throw shade on this tzadik and to bring accusation against him and to claim or bring forth all of his negativity. Don't, don't listen to him. Don't let him even open his mouth. And what's the defense? But, but Yeshua fell short. You know why he fell short? He was a very righteous person, very pious individual. You know why he fell short? Because he had children. Well, that's, not, that's okay. Yeah, but he didn't raise the children right. And the children married out of the faith, as did many, many Jewish people during the Babylonian exile. And they became assimilated. And Yeshua lived with tremendous guilt. And in fact, he felt he was unworthy. And what does God say? God says in his defense, Halayza ud mutzal me'esh. This is a firebrand saved from a terrible fire that ravaged our, ravaged our people. In other words, you have to look at the whole picture. You know what it meant to be a Jew? You know what it meant to go through persecution? Do you know what it meant when the Jewish people had their entire life collapse in front of them? A, a, a system of, of, of life and governance that had lasted for almost a millennia, almost a thousand years, suddenly collapses? How do you replace it? How do you deal with it? How do you continue to fu- function? They, they don't know what to do. Nobody knew what to do. I meet so many people who tell me with anger and sometimes a little sadness that they're, they're, they're not involved in Yiddishkeit today. 
and it's all the Hebrew teacher's fault. He would throw the pushka at me and wrap my fingers and he would just yell and scream, if only Hebrew school would be what Hebrew school is today, you know I would be probably a very pious and devout Jew, <laughs> as one, one uh, elderly member of a show once said, and I gave a good sermon for a change. He said to me, he says, Rabbi, where were you 60 years ago? <laughs> where were you when I could have done something with my life? He said to me. <laughs> but the, the, in fairness, it's not, it's not really appropriate to blame these people. These were, they were Holocaust survivors, people who came from Europe. They didn't speak the language. They didn't understand the new generation. They were doing the best they could. They, they were educated children. The way they were educated, they didn't know the difference. Of course, they, of course they beat you. They beat everybody. They didn't know the difference. I'm not even your age, I used to get beaten. I mean, everybody got, they, they didn't know better. You know, you know, you call them kooks, but the truth is they were transplanted from a different environment, a different world, thrown into a situation. I don't know if they could be uh, looked at in that kind of ter terrible way. They were all survivors and they were all angry. You, you, ha you blame them for being angry? No, but I didn't understand it. No, <laughs> of course we didn't. The young people didn't understand it. Young Canadian kids didn't understand what, this, what was survivors. was eating up these survivors. And that's the source of the word stia. Stia is to veer from the correct path. When you have something going in this direction, you have something else leading from That is side. correct. It veers over from the path that, it, that it stia, was supposed to take. Stia is, stia yes, is veering from the path. But that's like the New York Times tweeting that airplanes aim themselves at, at, at buildings. Well, they were, the point they, they, they were <laughs> veered from logic from the day they were born. That's, that's fine. That's but story. the point is airplanes don't veer themselves and people don't just veer themselves. Something veered them. We're talking here about the veerer. Who veered the people off the path? Which incidentally doesn't remove your freedom of choice. But the point of the Satan is that the Satan is that force that directed people in that, gener in that direction. Which directed them in that direction either for the good, as was the case with Bil'am, or it, for the bad. In, in Bil'am's case, 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 the Malach tried uh, to direct Eov. them in a good way. In Eov's case, the Malach brought came in a bad way. The point is there is a force. It's, it's a veering from Correct. The, the Satan either does stia. Correct. But there's the still a Satan. Yes, but there's still a Satan. Still a veerer. No. No. A Satan is not a good thing. A Satan is not a good thing. When the Satan does a good thing, the one time there is a Malach who comes to push a person off a bad path, it says, Vayisyatsev Malach Hashem li Satan loy. A Malach Hashem came to sat on him. When it talks about in Zechariah that there was a Malach who came, it doesn't say that there was a Malach who came to sat on. It says, he was Lefnei Malach Hashem, he was before the angel of God, the Hasatan, Oymed al Yeminoi, the Satan. And the Veerer. Not the Veerer, the Satan. Here in Balak, in Parshish Balak, when he talks about Bilam being pushed onto a path, he's Malach Hashem, he's a Malach of mercy who comes to sat on. Over there it's not a noun, over there it's a verb. Over here in Zechariah, it's a noun. And in the book of Eov, it's a noun. He is Hasatan. There is a Satan, a Malach whose name is Satan. And that Malach has one direction. All he knows how to do is point out your deficiencies, is collect everything wrong about somebody. And the truth is, nobody is perfect. And everybody falls short sometimes. And if they collected every single thing you ever said or thought or did, none of us would look that great. So the Satan shows up with a big bag of demerits. That's his job. As if you go back now to Eov, where it's not a Malach, it's not a Malach Hashem, it's a Satan. Vayoymer Hashem el Ha-Satan. God said to the Satan, capital T, capital S, to the Satan. What did he tell him? Mayan Tovi, where are you coming from? Vayan Hasatan. That's the third time two in, three, in, in, in two verses. The Satan is named as the Satan. His Satan says, oh, I am coming from. I've been Mishut Ba'aretz. I've been going all over, orbiting all over, and collecting dirt on everybody. So yes, there's a verb there in what he was doing, but he's also a noun. He's a Satan. And when he's a good guy, he's not Hasatan. The Malach Hashem was not, a, not the Satan. In Zechariah, he is the Satan. And the Satan wants to open his mouth. And how does Hashem defend him? He's a Ud Mutzal This is a survivor. This is a person who came out of the fire. Who are you to open a mouth at him? You can accuse everybody of anything. And maybe some of the stuff will stick. But you have to see it in context. You have to see it in perspective. So often we see a person, we judge them, and then you say, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. And you start to tell you, did you know this, that, the other thing? I didn't know those things. Ah. And now that you know those things, oh, it's a little different. Great. That's what we said at the beginning. Don't judge. 
That's God's job to judge. The Satan just collects all the information that's bad. He doesn't have context. That's not his job. That's not his job. His job is just to point out the deficiencies. Just to point out what was wrong. All the things that were wrong. Almost always, when people get judged, if you look at the bigger picture, a very different image starts to emerge. It's almost always to a fault. It almost never happens otherwise. You have to see the big picture. But the Satan's job is just to collect the dirt. That's his job. All these reporters, they're just collecting dirt on everybody. What, they're such big tzaddikim themselves? He's not the Yitzhahara at all. Ah, he's not the Yitzhahara. There's Marim Bava Basra. We'll get to that in a minute. But the first thing I want to show you is that there is a Satan in Judaism. You cannot say there's no Satan. It's like saying there's no resurrection in Judaism. It's like, it's like saying there's no Gilgul in Judaism, no reincarnation. Of course there is. It's just that what another faith system might call a force that God cannot overcome, chas v'shalom, or God has to contend with, God forbid, as an equal, this is pure heresy from our perspective. We're not allowed to, we're not allowed to look at it that way. From our perspective, God has no equal, God has no consort, God has no friend, God has no wife, God has no buddy, chas v'shalom. There's only HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of course. At the same time, there is a Satan. And what is the Satan? The Satan is the angel whose job is to collect the dirt on you. And then come and point it out. And there's a court case, and he's the prosecutor and the angel. As one lawyer once told me, he said, Rabbi, I have one master. I thought he was going to tell me Hashem. He said, the guy who pays my bills. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'll prosecute all day if that's what he pays me to do. He pays me to defend, I'll defend him all day. He says, that's what the lawyer told me. He says, that's, I got one master. That's it. You pay me? I'm do, I'll, do, I'll do your job he, for you. He who pays the piper and so forth. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to offend the law profession. My, my point is this. The Satan, is the Satan a bad guy? He is actually a bad guy because when Mashiach comes, guess what's happening to the Satan? He's going to the slaughterhouse. God's going to kill him, finish him, destroy him because he's all negative. But he has a role to play. And poor guy, that's his job. That's going his to the job. slaughterhouse or losing his job? No, no, he's getting shechter. He's finished. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm just gonna, uh, we, uh, I, I did point out for you a number of locations in the scripture. You cannot say there's no Satan. There is a Satan. And we even have a Satan who is busy on Rosh Hashanah. The Satan busy on Rosh Hashanah is back to Eov. That could be as, as, as ancient as Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Okay, the time of the patriarchs. The Ramam has this whole discussion about the Satan. And he says, you know, that Rish Lakish tells us in the Gemara Meseches Bava Basa on page 16, Rish Lakish says, Hu ha Satan, hu Yitzhahara, hu Malach The evil inclination, the angel of death, the Satan, it's all the same force. It's all the same force. The evil inclination that causes people to sin it is a satan. That's when Satan gets a hold of you. But who asked you to listen to him? Mm-hmm. He's a bad guy. The Malach Amavas is very hard not to. I mean, he, unfortunately, he's still in control. The Hashem gives him control. He can't fight with the Malach Amavas. People try. <laughs> it doesn't go well. Right? The Malach Amavas was given the right by Hashem to take somebody's life. The only one who ever contended with the Malach Amavas successfully was Aaron Cohen. Aaron HaKoyim was told by Moshe Rabbeinu, stop the Malach HaMavas. And he came out with a pan of incense and he meets the Malach HaMavas. There's an angel. Just because you and I can't see angels or can't envision them or understand what that means exactly, it doesn't mean there aren't angels. There was a story told that once the Rebbe Dashab, the fifth Rebbe, was on a coach. And he was going to what they call Dacha. A little uh, time for, to restore his health and get back to himself. Breathe the clean air in the Viennese Alps. Anyway, there was another very highly accomplished and intelligent person sitting there together with the Rebbe Rashab, but he was on the other end of the spectrum. He was a big professor, and it sounds like a big atheist, or a little atheist, but he didn't believe in all these ideas of Torah. And he's arguing with the Rebbe that there's no such thing as angels. It's ridiculous. How could you believe in the, you know, the, the tooth fairy? What do you believe in angels for? And the Rebbe Rashab said, see here, we're sitting in this wagon, and we're going to get some some, some R&R to restore our spirits so we can go back to work. And he says, and the coach person is going all the way there, and then he's coming right back. He's not going on vacation. This is his job. He said, and then there's the horse. And the horse keeps running. Do you know why the horse keeps running? You know what motivates him? He's going on vacation? No. He's getting paid. The, the, the person who is driving this wagon, he's got a sack of oats. And he holds it in front just beyond his reach. And every once in a while, he pulls the sack back so the horse is not too intelligent 
actually reaches the oats and he gets all excited and then he goes beyond his reach again, <laughs> runs and runs and runs for hours trying to reach the oats. And the Rebbe Rashab finished with this. He said, See der Far was the third zetnisht. See, because the horse doesn't see heaven, that means there's no angels. In other words, the ho- from the horse's perspective, all he knows is oats. He doesn't understand the coach person because the coach person is on the, has a job. A horse doesn't have a job. He doesn't understand vacation. A horse understands oats. So, the, so you're telling me a person says, I don't see heaven. Of course you don't see heaven. You're a fair. You don't see heaven. So we, we have a perspective of a horse. You see what a horse sees. You understand? An angel is not what Hollywood de- depicts it to be. A human being with little uh, frilly uh, wings and a halo who walks through walls. No, that's a person who has frilly, silly things attached to him just walking through walls, walking through fake walls. That's not an angel. What's an angel? I don't know what an angel is. It's not a person. It's not a fancy person. It's not a weird-looking person. It's not a superhero. That's not an angel. An angel's an angel. It's a force. So the, the Rambam and Murna Vuchim in chapter 3, uh, uh, chapter tw- in verse uh, segment, Three, section 3, verse 22, goes on in detail and it says, the Satan is seen in prophetic imagery. For example, David and Melech saw the Satan with a sword outstretched over Yerushalayim. It's not a literal sword. It's not, what, is he, what do you see, uh, Dracula outstretched over Yerushalayim? It's a, it's a concept, it's a nevuah, it's a prophetic vision that David and Melech saw. He says, the, what we just read now from Zechariah, Yeshua Kern Godel, sees a Satan standing there. The whole thing is a nevuah. Where did this Navua happen? Where it happened in Navua land. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a physical thing. Where does, where does calculus live? Which shelf do you put it on? It's a ridiculous concept. This, isn't, this doesn't take up space. It's not a physical thing. In other words, he says that the Satan is a force. It's a force that turns people away. It's a force that distances people from God. It's a force that takes people and veers them off the path. It's a force, though. It's a force. He says, just like a Yetzirah, that a person has it. We all stuck with the Yetzirah. And they don't have an easy time dealing with him. And every time you think you, you got him down, he metamorphosizes. He changes into a strong Yetzirah, like, like a superbug. Who you, they, they, every time they have new penicillin, a new superbug develops, so he can't seem to be able to, to knock down. So he says, the Satan, the Ramam says, the Satan is a Malach. That's for sure. Just like the Yetzirah is a Malach, the Satan is a Malach. And his words are, it's an angel without any doubt. Kiloi Mary says, He's also an angel. He's amongst the, the so to speak, the, 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 what's called literally children of God. It's, it's, it's a euphemism describing angels. So you suggest that the, that the Satan uh, lives in each individual? On some level. We have personal, we have personal satans, and then we have this uh, grand the proverbial satan, the master the satan. Grand, grand yeah, dragon. he oh. says grand dragon. It makes you feel better. He says, he says, we have a gemara that tells us that uh, every person has two malachim with him. Echad mi echad One malach on the right, one malach on the left. One is called the Yitzhak Hara. One's called the Yitzhak Tov. There you go. He says. So you see, it's called a good malach and a bad malach. We come on Friday night. There's two malachim accompany us. A good malach and a bad malach. There's so much about this. Anyway, I have now introduced you to the Satan. So you know now that saying that there's no such thing as Satan is patently ridiculous and makes no sense. There is a concept of Satan. It doesn't mean it's Satan the way the world depicts it or the way the Western world depicts it. We have, it come from, came from us, you know. It's a Torah idea. This is the Torah concept of the Satan. Okay, Having, this was just like a little preamble. Having said all this, let's move on now to our subject at hand. And the subject at hand, specifically, is going to be the idea of Elul and Rosh Hashanah. So, I'll begin, I'll begin not with the oldest text, an old text, 14th century text, quoting a 13th century sage, known as Maharaak. Maharaak. Moireinu Harav Rabavram Koizliner. He was the teacher, a teacher of the Maharil, Rabbi Yaakov Mullen. Okay, this is the, the greatest sages of the Ashkenaz Jewry, of, of, of uh, alsace loranic Loranic uh, Germanic Jewry. I believe that he was the Avbezdin in Wien, also known today as Vienna. Maharak. It's called Maharak. Moireinu Haravra Bavram Koizliner. So he says like this. 
The book of Maharil, of course, is the book of all of the Ashkenaz customs, right? Going back, it says 14th century. It's very old. It's not a new book. I started to allude to this. I touched on this a little bit in our first class, which was about why we blow shofar in the month of Elul. And then I mentioned this. You had a fit. And I said, patience, we're going to get there. That's section four. That episode four of the class. But now I'm going to go back to this part. And it says, quote, the, it starts off, it says, Minigu b'chol tfutzis Yisrael. It's a custom amongst all the diaspora of the Jewish people that we begin to blow shofar with the arrival of Elul. Maharak, he said, Minig kosher. It's an appropriate custom. Litkoa to blow shofar, Mirosh Chodesh Elul, from the beginning of Elul. Kedei, in order. La'arviv ha-sotan. To confound and thwart the Satan. It doesn't say listot, it says la'arviv, to confuse. To confound, to confound him or confuse him, to disable him is more like it. Ve'ein yodea matai hadin. This way, he won't know when Rosh Hashanah is. He won't know when the judgment is. V'yikatrik, once he knows when judgment day is, he'll show up at the court case and he'll have all these files with him. He's got files in everybody. All the bad stuff. We don't want that to happen. So therefore, we start blowing Rosh Hashanah. We start, we start Rosh Hashanah activities on the first day of Elul. And now he doesn't know when Rosh Hashanah is. But that now is contingent. Patience. On him being very dumb, right? He hasn't learned to no, count no. 40 yet. No, it's, it's, it's contingent <laughs> on Hashem not knowing the information anyways without the Satan being involved. You ask a good question. Yeah. Why does Hashem need prosecuting angels? Why does He need defending angels? Hashem knows everything. But you could ask that question about all of Judaism. Why did Avraham Avinu have to go and pray for Hashem should save Saddam? Doesn't Hashem know what to do? Why would somebody sick Chaman al son in your family, you daven to Hashem, no, Hashem doesn't know what to no, do? That's asking for something. And here it's a, it's Hashem, a Hashem is all good. Hashem is all good. If Hashem is all good, so no, why, 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 why? He knows what to do. He knows what's good. You could ask that question about all of Judaism. You say that God is all good. God knows everything. Let's go to sleep. But it's not exactly like that. There's a system God put in place. And there's a concept of a kitrog. And it says, Al-tiftach pela satan. Don't mention certain things. By verbalizing things, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And sometimes a bad one. So you have to be careful with our words. So he says, we're trying to be ma'arva. We're trying to confuse the satan. And he, this way, he doesn't know when the day of judgment is. And l- now listen to this. Lochain said, Ain't taken better of Rosh Hashanah. Don't blow the shofar in Erev Rosh Hashanah. Why? Ki az yosavar. Then he'll think, Hasatan shayyeb den avar. He'll say, I slept through judgment. Rosh Hashanah is over already. I know he sounds like the dumbest guy in town. But, I mean, that's what it says. That's what it says. So then he says, there's even a custom. Some people stop blowing the shofar three days before Rosh Hashanah. And he says, by the way, since we're talking about confusing the satan, let me tell you a few other things to do to confuse the satan. Since he seems so easy to confuse, and he still hasn't figured this out after 3,331 years. He still hasn't figured this out. He says, Why we start reading the Torah on Shabbat Bereshit? The Shabbat after Simchas Torah. It makes no sense, he says. Why? Because the Shabbat after Simchas Torah is the Shabbat after Rosh Hashanah. It should really start when? On Rosh Hashanah. Because that, that's actually what happened on Rosh Hashanah. I mean, like, it's a no-brainer. He says, this is mitam zeh for the same reason. We don't want him to know when the year starts. If we started to read the Torah from the beginning, he would say, Ah, I know when the year started. They made some Torah on the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah. That's it. I make sure to be awake and show up at the court case with all my files. But does he this not way, know when, uh, let's, ass- let's assume, does he not know when Rosh Chodesh is and he can't count the days? Oh, very good. So you want to know about Rosh Chodesh now, right? Remember Rosh Chodesh now. So now, this is what the Maharak says. Now I'm going to jump a couple hundred years to the Levush. Okay, now I'm taking you to a 17th century book who speaks about Halacha. And he says, you should know that on, uh, during the month of El, he says, we blow the shofar to waken everybody to tshuva and so on and so forth. And he says, and you know why else? V'oid, and also, k'day la'arva v'asatan. Levush, who wrote like a Shohan like compilation, following the same system of the Torah as the Shulchan Aruch did, but his didn't become the set table, but a very important book in Allah. Levush says, you know why else? And in, in the Shulchan Aruch is not brought. Ramad doesn't bring this. But Levush does. He says, oid, oid, and also, k'day la'arva v'asatan, 
He spells it out clearly. He shouldn't know which day is Rosh Hashanah. And then if he knows, will be Katrik. And then he says, Don't blow Erev Rosh Hashanah. And why do we do that? He says, well, that's in order to make a distinction between the shofar which is biblical and the shofar which is just a custom. That's what the Levush says. But if we take a look at Shulchan Aruch, in Shulchan Aruch it just says, Ve'ein tokim be'er Rosh Hashanah. Ramah says, in Simen Tov Kuf Be'alaf, chapter 581, in subsection 3 at the end, Ramah says, we don't blow Erev Rosh Hashanah. Why don't we blow, we blow Erev Rosh Hashanah? Take a look in the Magen Avram. The Magen Avram says, first he brings the same reason as the Levush, Lahafsik ben Tkiyas de Roshos, the Tkiyas de Chiyof, to make a difference between Tkiyas, the shofar blasts, which are ne- necessary, required, and ones which are just elective. That's why we the last day of shofar is the 28th day of El. And he says, I got this from the Levush. And then he says, but he says, but in the Minhagim, and here he goes back to the Minhagim, which are brought in the Maril and of that genre, the Aaron of Tirna and others. He says, there it says, that the reason we stop blowing the shofar of Russia is to confuse the Satan. In Cain he says, don't blow the shofar at all. Mm, don't blow the shofar at all. Why? Because here he says, if it's just to make a distinction, you shouldn't blow the shofar in shul, but you can blow it privately. But he says, if it's because of Ta'ar Vasatan, don't blow the shofar anywhere. So you're going to say, but what if a person uh, needs to practice blowing the shofar? So the Eliyahu Rabbah, the Eliyahu Rabbah says, I found on a, a, in a book called Amarkal that they found written on a parchment. So this sounds very ancient now. Sefer Amarkal Kosov al Klaf. It says on a parchment. Vizel Shoyne. Mi Shiroitza Litkoya Kadei Lilmay. The person who wants to blow the shofar. To learn how to blow the shofar in Rosh Hashanah. Tekeya be mikveh. Do it in a mikveh. Oy Bechei de Sagar. We're in a sealed room. You know, in Israel. In Israel they have these rooms. These Cheder Atum. God forbid if there's an attack. Yeah, you should go into the bomb shelter. <laughs> Go blow the shofar in the bomb shelter. Because Shaloy la Hargala Satan, you don't want the Satan to find out. Patience. I know. It sounds so weird. And you asked about Rosh Chodesh, right? Yeah. This is what I was getting. Says the Levush now, the Ain Mavarch in Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. We don't on the Shabbos before Rosh Hashanah do Shabbos Mavarchim. We will announce a new month is coming. We bless. No, we don't do this. Why? And not only we don't do it the Shabbos before, the Gam Maskir Rosh Chodesh. We don't mention Rosh Chodesh not in the offerings and not in the prayers of Rosh Hashanah. Why not? Hakoil, all of this, mitam kedei la'arve v'sasotan. Did the Sanhedrin not declare Rosh Chodesh Tishrei? The Sanhedrin did not declare Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. That is kind of correct. But it's a, you're getting into a whole no, new no, one no. subject. Uh, the, uh, no, no. The Sanhedrin would declare... They would declare Rosh Hashanah. The, the, no. when it's going to they wouldn't say Rosh Chodesh. I can't tell what they did then. But he says the point is in our time, it's all La Arve Satan. You ask, doesn't the Satan know where Rosh Chodesh is? Excellent question. Says the Levush. That's why we don't announce Rosh Chodesh. That's not why. Because if we announce Rosh Chodesh, what would be the trick? You announce Rosh Hashanah, but you, but, but you announce Rosh Chodesh. So he knows right it's Rosh Hashanah. So therefore, you make the Satan crazy. You blow the show for a whole month. Then you stop blowing the show for he doesn't know what's going on. You didn't have a Shabbos of Varchim. Of course, we say Tillam, we make a Fabrengen, but no Shabbos of Varchim. We don't make any big announcements. And then, and then Rosh Hashanah comes and we don't mention a word about Rosh Chodesh. It says Bakesa. It's the month when everything is hidden away. And he says, this is also the reason, now he quotes Maharak, also the reason that we don't start uh, Parshat Bereshit on Rosh Hashanah. And the Levush spells it out. He says, It's the most natural reading. What should you read on Rosh Hashanah? What happened on Rosh Hashanah? What happened on Rosh Hashanah? Uh, the Mechava were created. What else happened? <laughs> they ate from the wrong fruit tree. This is what happened. Do tshuva. They got judged. The first day of Rosh Hashanah in world history, which is the sixth day from the creation of Bereshit Bar Elikim, which is called the first day of creation because until humanity is created, the world has no purpose, no mission, and no meaning. So when humanity was created, what did God do on that day? He judged the people. Who were the people? Of the Mechava. How did they get judged? They got a reprieve. They didn't get killed. In fact, Adam went on to live for 930 years after. He could have lived even a thousand years. So Hashem forgave him. We say the same thing. Hashem, you know you're judging us today because it's Rosh Hashanah. That's what you do every year. But you gave him a brief. Give us a brief too. 
It says Tishrei, the world is created. That's when creation begins. This is Mamash Ben Haroi Mepnei Zed. This is when you should be reading it. He says, no, no. You know why? The Satan shouldn't figure it out. Because if he would do, <laughs> read Parsha Bereshah, he would say, aha, it must be Rosh Hashanah. I have an appointment and I'll take all of his files and he'll throw it at you and try to accuse you of all the things he did wrong. And he'll say, Vada, it's Rosh Hashanah. It's definitely Rosh Hashanah. Because the beginning of the Torah all over again. So, I showed you how the Satan makes his way into Menhagim Maharil. He makes his way into the Shulchan Aruch, and it's ca- not the Shulchan Aruch itself doesn't mention it, but the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch are mentioning it, and the Levush spells it out in vivid color. Elio Rabbi even tells you to hide in the mikveh, so the Satan shouldn't find you. Go in your bomb shelter, <laughs> in a sealed room. Really? I mean, like, how stupid do you think the Satan is? You think he didn't figure this out one year, a second year, a third year. Every year we somehow keep dodging a bullet. Every year he wants to show up with his files and it's too late and we get judged re- favorably. What, the Satan? I mean, every, every Jew in the world knows it's Rosh Hashanah. Most of the Gentiles know it's Rosh Hashanah. What is it, the Satan? How confounded in the head is he? How dumb is he? How could he be the only person who didn't figure this out? And he's an angel, Nach. If he was a person, you fool a person. He's, how could you fool an angel? The whole thing makes no sense. You mask him. It doesn't make sense. So lucky for me and you, we have a great Rebbe. And the Rebbe says that there is an answer, but the, you have to learn pshat right. You have to learn pshat right. So here's the interesting thing. The Satan and making trouble on Rosh Hashanah is a very old idea. Not just Elo. Rosh Hashanah. Besides the book of Eo, which we just read before, Besides that, there is a Gemara. The Gemara is found on page Tet Zayin of Mesechet Rosh Hashanah, the bottom of the page, in the very last line. The Gemara says, okay, help me understand this. It says you should blow a long shofar blast. Lama token by Rosh Hashanah. Why do we blow long shofar blasts on Rosh Hashanah? And the Gemara says, what kind of question is that? Why do we do it? Because God said to do it. It's like the reason for all mitzvahs. Why do we do it? The reasons for shofar, and there are 10 reasons given for shofar, but that's not the reason we blow shofar. We blow shofar because God says, Rachamana om artiku. God said blow. So the Gemara says, okay, so then why are you making broken sounds? Love and Marian. We have to, 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 Why are you making broken sounds for? So the Gemara says, what do you mean? Rachamana om ar zichrin trua. God said in his Torah, make it a remembrance of broken shofar sounds. Okay, says the Gemara, fine. You convince me. You blow long shofar blasts because God said to. You make sm- short shofar blasts because the Torah said to. God said to. So Lama taken a Marian, why did they do it first in a sitting posture? What we call Tchias de Meyushev, the regular shofar blowing ceremony. And then during the Shmon Esri, again we're blowing the shofar. Why do you have to blow the shofar twice for? Do you light the menorah twice on Hanukkah? Do you eat matzah twice on, Han- on Pesach? Kind of. You eat two helpings of cheesecake? Of course you do. What kind of question is that? So why do you have to blow the shofar twice? Two days is one thing. You have to blow it twice in one day? Why do we have two, se- two shofar blowing ceremonies? You know what the Gemara says? You know why we do it? <laughs> to confound the Satan, make the Satan crazy. <laughs> How does that make the Satan crazy? How does that confuse the Satan? If you blow the shofar twice, what, he thinks it's two times Rosh Hashanah? So Rashi it's says something very interesting. Rosh Hashanah is a special day, it's one long day. I, I, yeah, that's two days of Rosh Hashanah. But here we blow it twice on each day. So Rashi says, you know what means La'arviv? It means to disable. Shaloyastin. He shouldn't do his thing. Kishi Yishma Yisrael, when he hears the Jewish people, Mechavivin et mitzvah. He sees the way they love the mitzvah. Mistatet in Dvarav. Then he's dumbfounded. He gets overwhelmed. He has nothing to say because he sees the Jewish people love the mitzvah so much. Nobody can convince you that the sounds of Shofar are such a beautiful symphony. You know what? Let's do that again. That was so beautiful. You go to a concert and the singer or the person playing the instrument, encore, 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 everybody sees. Nobody asks for an encore when it comes to the Shofar. Just like nobody asks for second helpings of matzah. 
Ice cream, yes. Roast beef, yes. Matzah? Who says, ugh, that was so good. Can I, another matzah, please? Actually, matzah shmua is really good. Okay. If you, if you starve yourself all day and you haven't eaten matzah for, for at least a month before, yeah, then you can convince yourself matzah shmua is good at that one night. Nobody asks for doubles. Nobody asks for a second helping. <coughs> Nobody says, encore. What a concert that was. Oh, that that shofar sound. That was such a beautiful symphony. Play the shofar again. So why are we doing it again? So Rashi says, because we showed Hashem we love the mitzvah. We love the mitzvah. And he says, that is very powerful. And the Sutton sees such a powerful thing. He sees Jewish people love a mitzvah. The Sutton kind of, he feels, ah, who, who, who am I going to go up against here? People, they're ready to listen to the show for twice. Do I stand a chance? And that's why he melts away. You know, it's very interesting. Different commentaries on this Gemara. The Sefer HaAruch says that the Sutton is a malach. Right? It's a malach. And it says, just like it says that yes, Malach, Melitz, there's a Malach who brings you good news, as it says also in the book of Eov in chapter 33, the Malach who brings defense, he defends the people, shows their goodness, points out their, 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 their positive points. There's a Malach Mastin, there's also a prosecutorial Malach, Malach who comes and accuses. And uh, he's, uh, he's here to make trouble. He's here to make trouble. And, and he's uh, trying to get the Jewish people to stop doing a mitzvah. But when the Satan sees that we're mechav of the mitzvah, the Sefer Aruch says, when he sees how much we love the mitzvah, so we want to blow the, the, the shofar again, we want to sound the shofar again, so he says, it's like, he feels like a failure. He just loses his, he loses his motivation. He says, look at these people. I would like them to get them not to blow the shofar once, instead of blow it twice. There's nobody home. It's like, I'm not getting through these people. So he kind of melts away. And then the Aruch says, he hears the chauffeur, and he this reminds him of the big chauffeur, the great chauffeur. That was how El Mashiach comes. El Mashiach comes, he's finished. And then he starts remembering his uh, bitter end, and he kind of like slinks into the corner and shows up, and he doesn't mix into the things anymore. That's what the Sefer Aruch says. The Gulyani Ashas says something very interesting. We have what Rashi says here in his commentary. The Gulyani Ashas says, there's a Sefer called Pardis, HaPardis, was the author, author by Rashi. In the Sefer HaPardis it says that when God shut the Satan up, he attacked him twice. It says, Yiga Bacha HaSatan, right? In, in the book of Zechariah he says, Yiga Bacha HaSatan. Yiga, the exact language is, Vayoyimen Hashem ala Satan. Yiga Hashem Bacha, Hashem rebukes you. The Yiga Hashem Bacha, and Hashem rebukes you. So the shofar is like a rebuke of the Satan. It's, it's like nails on a blackboard for him. He can't stand that sound. And he hears it again, once and again, and it, it drives him away. So the Rebbe says something positively amazing. The Rebbe says, you're learning the wrong pshat, what means of la'arve vasatan. Over there for sure, it's clear from Rashi that la'arve vasatan doesn't mean that you're confusing the satan that he shouldn't know when Rosh Hashanah is. What does it mean? It means that when the, when, when, when the Satan sees the Jewish people engaged in Avedis Hashem and serving Hashem with such love and devotion, so, so the Satan kind of melts away. The Satan feels inadequate. He loses his motivation. So the Rebbe says an absolutely amazing thing. Do you know why we blow shofar on Elul, the month of Elul? And we've discussed this, not only in our first class, even episode two, and even episode three was talked about this. Days of grace, days we're close to Hashem. Alter Rebbe metaphorizes the king is in the field. We're very close to God now. So when we're close to God and we blow the shofar, why do we sound the shofar? We said we sound the shofar because it's the sound of tshuva. We said that, we saw that in the tour, we saw that in the levush. And in fact, it's, it's like a seamless continuation. So the idea of the arv of satan then is, when the satan sees the Jewish people that are sounding the shofar, and saying salichot, and reading Udava Hashem Ayri, and doing it, and reaching out to each other in love, as per the three episodes prior. He's doing all these things. The Satan sees the Jewish people, what does he feel like? The Satan says, God's not going to listen to all the, the, the dirt on these people, because they're coming clean. In other words, like this. In the same way that the Gemara says, that the Satan's motivation is drained by the dedication to the mitzvah, the concept of la'arv as a satan doesn't mean we're going to confuse the satan. It means when we, the Jewish people, wake up and do what's right, it demotivates the satan. 
The Satan has no more motivation because we see what we did in the month of Elul, that it's a Chaydash HaKeshbon. And it even is possible that Satan says he doesn't any idea Masai Din. He doesn't know when the judgment is. The Rebbe says an unbelievable Chiddush. The Rebbe says when a Yid does Tshuva before Rosh Hashanah, it is eminently possible that God could already judge him and write him into the book of life before Rosh Hashanah. Already in the month of Elul. And you'll say, do we have a precedent that shows that a Yid engaging in t- prayer and in, in tshuva could actually bring about a change in God's judgment? And the answer is, yes! Where? Chizkiyahu HaMelech. Chizkiyahu HaMelech, the book of Kings, tells the story, and it's also found in the prophecies of Isaiah, of Yeshaya. He turns to the wall, as the Gemara says in Brachas, after the prophet comes to him and says, you are doomed. And he says, no, I'm not. In fact, I don't even want to hear what you have to say anymore because you delivered your prophecy, you delivered your message, and now he says, I have a tradition from my great-grandfather from David HaMelech that even if the sharp sword is on your neck, you never give a pope. And he turns to the wall and he begins to pray. And what does Hashem do? Through his tshuva and etfila, it says, and this is a quote from the book of Kings, chapter 20, verse 6, it says, V'hisafti al yomecha chamesha eseishona. He got 15 years. He, Hashem added 15 years. When did Hashem judge him? He didn't say, okay, Cheskyo, I'll put you in a freezer and in Rosh Hashanah I'll judge you and we'll come up, we'll come up with, with some, we'll see what we come up with. He judged him right there and then. Then what's the purpose of confusing the Satan? Confusing the Satan if means... If the judgment no, happened here's the, before, here, he is already disarmed. That's, that's exactly that the point. point. That's exactly the point. The, the whole idea of us doing all the things we do in Elul is we're trying to actually get the judgment done before. You know what this is like? We have an election day coming in Canada. Mm. Unfortunately for us, it's on Shmini Atzeres. It's terrible. So what are we going to do? At least they made accommodations for us. We can vote early. Mm. I know how I'm voting for. We better do it. Yeah, we better do it. So I'm going to go vote early. <laughs> Who says you have to wait for election day? <laughs> on Rosh Hashanah, exactly. on Rosh Hashanah, <laughs> we elect God, so to speak. We crown God as the king. Who says you have to wait for Rosh Hashanah? Who says you have to wait for Rosh Hashanah to do tshuva? I saw once a cartoon. It says, there's a picture of a rabbi with a big billboard. It says, do tshuva today. Beat the rush. Don't wait for Yom Kippur. Do tshuva today. <laughs> Why come later? Do tshuva now. This is the whole idea, Maharak said. You're going to confound the satan. If the satan knows on which day we do tshuva and he knows which day we get judged, then he comes with all the, 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 the nimerits. He comes with a whole bag of accusation. But if we're starting to blow the shofar now and we're doing all the special things now in the month of El, we're getting Hashem's judgment now. <laughs> Forget it now. The satan says, I don't know what to do. Maybe these people are judged already. He doesn't know whose nimerits, who to accuse when. Some people, he can only accuse them of Rosh Hashanah. Some people did the tshuva already on Beis Elul. Some people waited for Zion Elul. Some people waited for Chayel. But everybody's doing tshuva at different times and different levels. The point is, if it's one day, the Sutton has a day in his calendar. He knows the alarm rings in his, in his uh, day timer. Now go and bring the Sutton. Now go bring. But here, you have all these people getting judged and they're doing tshuva at different times. It's staggered. The Sutton doesn't have a day anymore. He used to have a day. In the book of Job, he has a day. But he, the Sutton shows up. The Sutton doesn't have a day. He's got 40 days. He's all confused. He's all over the place. And then it gets even better. The Rebbe says, that's what the Marak says. What do we do, Erev Rosh Hashanah? Silence the chauffeur. He says, uh oh. You mean they're done already? They're done. So that's the meaning. Confounding the Sutton doesn't mean the Sutton is stupid. It doesn't mean the Satan doesn't know when Rosh Hashanah is. It means the Satan doesn't know when the judge, when the Dinah Mishpat is. And that's what it says here in Maril. It says here, Eini Yadea Masai Hadin. He doesn't know, not when Rosh Hashanah, the Levush changes. He, the Levush writes, Eini Yadea Masai Rosh Hashanah. But the Levush went away from the words of the Marak. Marak in the Sefer Maril says, Eini Yadea Masai, not Rosh Hashanah, but Hadin. Not Yom Hadin. Eini Yedeo Masai Hadin. He doesn't know when you're judged. The Satan is a Malach. He's not God. He doesn't know everything. All he knows is his little Ketrugim. He knows he's got dirt on you and on me and he's got dirt on everybody. He comes to accuse you but he doesn't know when to accuse you. Because we ourselves don't know when Hashem is going to judge us. All we know is that if we, be, if we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we get to work and do tshuva and reach out to Hashem, we sound that shofar and we listen to its cry and we do what we're supposed to do and we repair our relationships with others and, and, and we engage in supplication, 
whether we are whether you're Sephardic and you're, you're waking up at six o'clock in the morning from the or five o'clock in the morning from the beginning of the month where you're saying Ladava the Oiri and later and later soon Ashkenaz and join waking up early whenever it's gonna be, but we're doing all these things. In doing all these things, we're actually bringing forth the blessings from Hashem. We're doing chuva now. We're getting the din today. That means La Arva Satan. And the Rebbe goes on to say, yes, so how do you explain the business of not making, not starting the reading of the Torah from Rosh Hashanah? What's that? That's actually less, not more. And how do you explain the business of not announcing Rosh Chodesh? That's less, not more. The Rebbe says an amazing thing. The Rebbe says that sometimes the fact that we relax our guard in and of itself confuses the Satan. The Satan gives up hope. Because you know what happens when you're in competition, when one pushes harder, the other one pushes harder. And the best example I can think of this is, I was watching the election in Israel today. You know, like, everybody knows what has to be done. All the people in the country know who they want to vote for. Nobody's really undecided. What's the question? Who got motivated to go up and go vote? It's really the question who motivated the people. It's all about motivation. And in the end, a lot of times when people think that the election is in the bag, they don't go vote, and that's why they lose the election. Say, ah, he's going to win anyway. Yeah, don't say that. I never assume my candidate is going to win. I usually have opinions. I usually feel very strongly about who I want to vote for. Never assume he's going to win. Because you never know. There's always upset. So you have to motivate. And it's the same kind of thing over here. The Sutton's got to get motivated. But here it's a demotivator. Here, on the contrary, if we say we're blowing the chauffeur to wake up the people, if we're saying the supplication and doing all these things, why would we take away from Jewish people the schus, the merit of Simchas Torah? Do you know that the merit of Simchas Torah is, in some ways, eclipses all the other merits? It's such an amazing thing. Starting Bereshus all over, why would we take that away? The idea of Rosh Chodesh, it's a kapara, it's an atonement. Why would we take it away? There's a beautiful story told of the Rebbe Rashab. This man comes to the Rebbe, and he asks the Rebbe to help him needs a blessing. And the Rebbe says, I can't help you. Sister, Rebbe can't help me? I can't help you. And the person was so distraught. The Rebbe can't help me. His whole thing was, the Rebbe, come to the tzad, the, Rebbe's gonna, the Rebbe couldn't help him. And he began to weep bitterly. He's out in the foyer and he's weeping, he's crying his eyes out. The Rebbe can't help me. He doesn't want to bless me. And the Rebbe Rashab's older brother, Rebbe Zalman Aaron, sees this fellow and he says, why are you crying? And he says, I went to the Rebbe. He says, won't bless me. He said, he can't help me. So the Rebbe Rashab went to his younger brother and he said, this is a Rebbe? A Yid comes to you and you don't help him? And now he's outside brokenhearted? He's weeping uncontrollably? The Rebbe Rashab says, hey, let him come back in. And he came back in and the Rebbe Rashab gave him a bracha. So the question is, what happened there? The B'zalman Aaron was just a chassid. But he came to tell his younger brother, how, how, how dare you not be a Rebbe? What, is that how being a Rebbe works? So the Rebbe explains the story in the most amazing way. The truth is that the Rebbe couldn't help him at that time. Mm. Because he didn't do tshuva. You think the Rebbe's a magician? We have to become a recipient for the blessing. A Rebbe could be mamshek. A Rebbe can actualize, draw down a blessing. But the person, he wasn't ready to do tshuva. He wasn't ready to think. He wasn't. So when, when he heard from the Rebbe, I can't be helped. Really? The Rebbe said, I can't help you. Then he did tshuva. The Rebbe Shab heard he's crying, so let him come back in. He said, no, I can help him. You understand? So in, 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 the, in, the, in other words, in, the, in scientific language, like the Rebbe said when he had the heart attack, that he said he learned that how do they, get, how do they draw blood? Through a vacuum. And there has to be, in other words, the idea of bittel. When a yid is in a state of bittel, when he gets full of himself, if the vial is full, he can't draw blood. In order to take, to be mamshech, to bring something forth, there needs to be an emptiness, a vacancy. When we make ourselves empty before Hashem, we humble ourselves before Hashem, then we can draw forth the blessing. A yid, a yid asks a question. He says, it's Rosh Hashanah. Why don't we fire up all the engine? I mean, it's a day of judgment. Why don't we, why don't we do Simchas Torah today and, and start reading Parshas Benesha's too? And, and why are we mentioning Rosh Chodesh? And you say, we're, we're trying to be Ma'arvah. We're trying to confound the Satan. So who's the Satan? Well, you know, not everything you did this year was exactly so good. And there's this Malach called the Satan. And he collects everybody's inequities, all everybody's problems and issues. And he's coming and he's like, <laughs> and this guy, this woman, you know, they should get a good judgment. What about A, B, C, and D? And they say, oh, A, B, C, and D. A Yid hears that there's a Satan involved. A Yid hears that there's an angel that's bringing for all of his or her inequities. How does it make you feel? 
Makes you a little nervous. That's like the candidate who comes out to, to his people and he says, do you see what's going on? He'll go and say, the other side is winning. And then we go, really? And what does it do? It motivates them. So actually, the Rebbe says, that's the meaning of the, the Arva Vesa Satan. Sometimes it's by not doing it that we're, on the contrary, able to motivate us to do a bigger tshuva, to pray to Hashem even harder. And in some ways, there's another element in which the Satan sees we're not even using all our firepower. So if the Satan sees you're not using all your firepower, he doesn't feel he has to use all his firepower. The point is, the Satan is a malach, the Satan is a job. This is all part of a one big grand calculation. But the notion of confusing Satan, lying to Satan, making Satan crazy, that's actually crazy. That makes no sense. You can't lie to a malach, you can't fool a malach. However, there is a notion that each and every one of us could rise to the occasion, could do tshuva, could utilize the days of Elul. And if we utilize the days of Elul right, that's how we confound the satan. That's how we bring the Jad Dinu Mishpat early. You cast your ballot early. You get our Kaddish Baruch Hu to do what, it, what he promises to do to put us in Sefer Achayim. And we indeed should all be written and inscribed and sealed in the Book of Life and the Book of Happiness and the Book of Goodness. It should be a year of Ur, a year of light, a year of Bracha, a year of blessing, and in Merz Hashem, a year of Geula, of redemption, with the coming of Mashiach Tzedkeinu, and Heira, will be Amenu, Amen. 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 Amen.